Howdy. Uh, I'm going to talk about the profitable shift from oil and coal to efficiency and renewables. And that's what we do at Rocky Mountain Institute. We call it reinventing fire. Uh, we are often offered the stupid multiple choice test, which if more clearly stated, would read something like this. Would you rather die of climate change or oil wars or maybe nuclear holocaust? Of course, a better answer, which we are seldom offered, is none of the above. And <clears throat> that's what we get if we actually use energy in a way that saves money, because then those problems and a lot of others go away, not at a cost, but at a profit. In climate change, for example, we keep griping about cost, burden, and sacrifice because the economic theorists got the sign wrong. They forgot that it's cheaper to save energy than to buy energy. Therefore, climate protection is not costly, but profitable. Uh, and uh, actually, how fast would we have to do it? Well, if the energy used to make a dollar of G GDP uh, <clears throat> kept on drifting down just 1% a year, then our carbon emissions would triple by 2100. Then we're all toast. But the goal is to make toast, not be toast. If we could make energy intensity come down 2% a year rather than 1, the carbon emissions would level off. And if we, if we could drop the energy intensity 3 or 4% a year, uh, that would be enough to stabilize the climate to the extent that irreversible changes aren't already happening. So could we do 3 or 4% a year lower energy intensity? Well, actually, the US routinely does that 2 to 4% a year without paying attention. California is a percentage point faster than that. China is even faster than that. There are a lot of attentive companies that have been cutting their energy intensity 6 to 16% a year and making billions of dollars profit substituting efficiency for fuel. So why should 3 or 4% a year be so hard? And since everybody who does energy efficiency makes money at it, why should this be a costly activity? Well, in the US, we know how to save half our oil and gas and 3 quarters of our electricity much, for much lower cost than we're paying for them right now. And even Japan, which is two or three times less energy intensive than we are, has figured out how to triple its energy efficiency. So I want to tell you briefly two stories about oil and electricity. Each accounts for a little more than two-fifths of the fossil carbon emissions. And of course, the electricity story is almost entirely about coal. So let's start with oil. Uh, <clears throat> just uh, five years ago, my team published a very detailed study for the Pentagon uh, on how to get the U.S. completely off oil by the 2040s, led by business for profit. And the profit comes about <clears throat> because it, it costs <clears throat> uh, only about $15 a barrel to get off oil. If you want to know more, you can go to oilendgame.com and the whole thing is free. But here's what it can look like. Uh, the um, <clears throat> use of oil, that's the heavy red line and the imports of oil, the dotted line, instead of heading towards the upper right, could be brought down along the green curves if we redouble the efficiency of using oil. This turns out to cost an average of 12 bucks a barrel. And then the other half of the oil we can replace with safe natural gas and advanced biofuels not related to the food system. Uh, and those, that costs an average of 18 bucks a barrel. So <clears throat> altogether, the average cost is 15. And uh, the crux technologically is, of course, tripling the efficiency of our cars, trucks, and planes, because transport uses 70% or so of the oil. And there's a common recipe to do that. You make the vehicles lightweight, uh, more aerodynamic, with advanced propulsion. So you end up with uh, cars that save 69% of the fuel, uncompromised, safer. It's like buying gasoline for 57 cents a gallon often with better performance as well, like this uh, diesel hybrid gives 155 miles an hour and 94 miles a gallon, although not at the same moment. Uh, and the, the surprise to many people is that the ultralighting is free because it's paid for by simpler automaking uh, and a several-fold smaller powertrain. For example, we now have technology that can make carbon fiber structures uh, in less than a minute strong and stiff. Uh, this is my carbon cap, I guess. And uh, <clears throat> you can whack this with a sledgehammer and not hurt it. In fact, we have. Uh, <clears throat> think of this like a Saudi Arabia we just found drilling in the Detroit formation, because that's how much oil the country saves if we make our cars and light trucks out of this stuff. We now have the technology to do that cost-effectively. In fact, the car costs the same. Uh, <clears throat> 
because uh, you, you have no body shop, no paint shop, 99% less tooling cost and two-thirds smaller powertrain. That pays for the material. And meanwhile, it gets safer because this absorbs 12 times as much crash energy per pound as steel, uh, but the car loses half its weight and half its fuel use. Uh, <clears throat> of course, in airplanes, it's much the same story. The first one-fifth saving is free, like the Boeing Dreamliner on the left. Factor three on the right looks like a really good deal, and Boeing is test flying it. Uh, Walmart has saved already 38% of its fuel in its truck fleet, and uh, you don't have to look quite as weirdly aerodynamic as the one on the right to get to a factor three. There's also a lot to be done in the non-vehicle uses of oil, uh, but the general lesson is the technology for wringing more work out of our oil keeps improving a lot faster than even the stunning advances in finding and lifting oil. Uh, <clears throat> if you want a little idea what's coming at us, we designed this one nine years ago with some industry partners. It's an uncompromised mid-sized suburban assault vehicle at 67 miles a gallon on gasoline or 114 on hydrogen. The gasoline version would pay back in one year. Uh, <clears throat> or here's a concept car Toyota showed two years ago with the interior volume of a Prius but it, it has half the fuel use and one-third the weight. It's a plug-in hybrid with a little half-liter engine that tucks in under the rear seat. Uh, and this might be dismissed as just a brag because concept cars don't normally get to market, except that the previous day, Torre, the world's biggest maker of carbon fiber, had announced a factory to mass-produce carbon fiber car parts for Toyota, uh, <laughs> clearly a statement of strategic intent, which now Honda and Nissan have picked up on, so now the next leapfrog is off and running. Uh, <clears throat> of course, we're making all this stuff happen faster through what we call institutional acupuncture. That is, we figure out where the business logic is congested, not flowing properly. We stick little needles in it to get it flowing. This is as much fun as you can have with clothes on, and it works very well. Uh, Boeing, for example, has flipped the whole airframe sector's competitive conditions in just a few years with the Dreamliner, saving a fifth of the fuel, as I said, uh, showed you the picture, at no extra cost. Uh, except that now, uh, having done that efficiency leapfrog with carbon fiber structures and better engines and aerodynamics and so on, they're rolling out that suite of innovations into every airplane they make before Airbus can steer itself out of the ditch. Thereby, they make a breakthrough competitive strategy. Uh, hold that thought. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned Walmart's progress with its suppliers in doubling the efficiency of the heavy trucks. Then we'll go to triple efficiency eventually. One of our greatest allies now is the military, which has just started to count the value of saved fuel 10 or 100 times higher than before uh, in order to reflect the huge cost in both blood and treasure to deliver the fuel to the thing that's using it in the theater in wartime. And <clears throat> that much higher value on saved fuel is going to drive huge innovation that will come back to our civilian cars, trucks, and planes in much the same way that military R&D already gave us, little things like the internet, the global positioning system, and the jet engine and microchip industries. Uh, <clears throat> the, we always knew the hardest sector to shift would be light vehicles, but I suggested in that book five years ago that Detroit should try the strategy Boeing was just rolling out. Uh, and. Uh, a couple of years later, Ford hired the head of Boeing Commercial Airplanes, who had led that, as its own CEO. You'll notice that three years now after that, uh, Ford no longer looks like GM and Chrysler. It did not go broke. It did not ask for a bailout. And it's a hotbed of innovation, uh, helping lead the charge in light weighting and electrification. Watch this space. Of course, the workers and dealers are keen for innovation to save their industry or what's left of it as this tsunami of creative destruction washes over them. There are leapfrogs. I've started a couple of them. There are new policies that make all this much more profitable. So uh, we're in the most exciting time in automaking for at least a century. Now, electricity. Uh, there are two revolutions going on. One is in saving most of the electricity we use, both in buildings which use 70% of it and in industry that uses 30%. And also, we're starting to make it in very different ways because now the traditional Central steam raising or thermal power plants, whether they use coal, uh, gas, or, or uranium, uh, <clears throat> have become obsolete and uncompetitive. They're kind of like the Victorian 
steam locomotives, a magnificent technological achievement, except then something better came along. And right now, the utilities are roughly in the position that Ma Bell was in when cell phones had just been developed. Except not all of them realize it yet. Now, efficiency really works where you let it. Uh, for example, the, uh, the green dots here show the per capita use of electricity in California flat for the last 30 years, while per capita real income went up 79%. Notice what happened in the rest of the country. I think Texas is even above that curve. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, this saved Californians about $100 billion of utility investment, for which they doubtless found better uses. Equally important in doing this were uh, early and good efficiency standards for buildings and appliances, and rewarding utilities for cutting your bill, not for selling you more energy. What a thought. Uh, rewarding what we want. It turns out that if all of the United States used electricity as productively as the average of the top 10 states, all adjusted for economic mix and climate, then five-eighths of our coal-fired electricity would become unnecessary. If you don't embarrass easily, look up the Texas opportunity because it's shown state by state at this website. Uh, well, whatever exists is possible, uh, and even those top 10 states can get a whole lot more efficient uh, just by using energy in an economically efficient way. So how far could they go? Well, several fold just with technology well established in the late 80s. Uh, but that's before we harness a new kind of innovation in how we put technology together. For example, if you were to come to my banana farm, uh, <clears throat> it's uh, at 7,100 feet up in the Rockies where the temperature can go to minus 47 on occasion. You can get frost any day of the year. You can get 39 days of continuous midwinter clouds, not exactly Dallas. But if you come in out of this, uh, the snowstorm into this atrium, there you are in the banana jungle where I'm now har uh, ripening crops number 29 and 30, and then you realize there's no heating system because I didn't need one, and it was 1100 bucks cheaper up front not to put one in, but to invest instead in super insulation, super windows, ventilation, heat recovery, and so on. And I ended up also then, for an extra cost of buck fifty a square foot, or 1%, uh, saving 99% of the water heating energy and 90% of the household electricity, which would be five bucks a month if I didn't make it with solar, and half the water. And the whole thing was a 10-month payback in 1983. Now we have much better technologies. Or here's an ordinary-looking tract house in a climate that goes to 113. We later did the same at 115. This is comfortable with no air conditioner, and it built in reasonable quantity. It's about 1,800 bucks cheaper to build, 1,600 cheaper over time to maintain because there's no heating or cooling equipment. It's just designed right. Or here's a house in steamy Bangkok, worse than Houston climate. Uh, and uh, this one's comfortable with a tenth the normal air conditioning and exactly normal construction cost. Or here's a very energy intensive kind of building called a wet lab that uses a fifth the allowed amount of electricity uh, under the strictest code in the country and gets over 50 units of cooling per unit of electricity. Both those numbers can be improved by another factor, too. Had the same engineer that did the Persian draft tower and night roof spray system been allowed to do the pumping system. So what these examples all show is if you optimize the whole building as a system, uh, <clears throat> then you can... Uh, <clears throat> get big savings cheaper than small ones. You can get expanding returns, not diminishing returns to investments in energy efficiency. And the same is true also for big buildings. Here's a big one you probably heard of uh, that we're retrofitting now. Uh, and our, our partners, Johnson Controls, Clinton Climate Initiative, Jones Lang LaSalle and the owners uh, figured out with our conceptual approach how to get 38% energy savings with a three year payback, which is several times what they thought they'd be able to do. And the trick is to remanufacture all the windows on site uh, in an improvised little window factory into super windows that are almost perfect in letting in light without heat. So the, you end up <clears throat> uh, blocking the winter heat loss uh, by roughly threefold or more. You block half the summer heat gain. And with that and better lights and stuff, you end up cutting the design cooling load by a third. So now instead of having to close and tear up Fifth Avenue to dig up the old chillers and uh, replace and expand them, you can renovate them in place uh, <clears throat> and uh, 
reduce them and thereby save about $7 million worth of capital that helps pay for everything else. And we figured if you did the same treatment coordinated with the regular 20-year renovation of a glass curtain wall tower in Chicago, you'd end up saving three quarters of the electricity slightly cheaper than the regular renovation that saves nothing. The same mentality, of course, applies in industry. One of my favorite examples involves pumping, which is the biggest use of motors, uh, and uh, motors use most of the world's electricity. So it turns out that if you redesigned a particular pumping loop, you could take the pumping power down by 92% at lower cost uh, just by using fat, short, straight pipes instead of skinny, long, crooked pipes. This is not rocket science, this is good Victorian engineering rediscovered, and we left a factor of four on the table. Uh, <clears throat> and pumping is also nice in showing how you need to start your savings downstream. Here's what I mean by that. You put 100 units of coal in the power plant, and there are various losses at the plant and along the way, and only a tenth of your energy comes out the pipe as flow. Turn those compounding losses around backwards into compounding savings, and every unit of flow or friction you save in the pipe saves 10 units of fuel and cost of pollution and global weirding back at the power plant, and it also makes your upstream equipment smaller, simpler, and cheaper, so you save the most energy and the most capital cost. And it's not that hard to get rid of flow or friction in pipes. Instead of laying them out this way with two right angle bends, therefore friction, and usually two valves, how about like this with no bends and no valves or one valve, when my colleague Peter Rumsey did that as a retrofit in the Oakland Museum, notice the weird looking pipe layout. He saved three quarters of the piping energy, or pumping energy rather, and uh, eliminated 15 pumps that will never again use electricity and maintenance. So if, it's, if you make the pipe layout easy to draw, there's no reason to do that because the computer draws it anyway, uh, <clears throat> or if you make it look pretty, it probably won't save energy and money. Well, we apply this sort of thinking in our industrial practice lately to over $30 billion worth of facilities in 29 sectors. So our latest uh, uh, chip fab design, uh, even more efficient than the one we helped with uh, for TI and Richardson, great project uh, shown in the upper right. Uh, but our latest one um, saves on, on paper so far, we expect it will in reality about two thirds of the energy and half the capital cost. Our latest data center, uh, just being completed next month in Britain is expected to save three quarters of the electricity uh, and a tenth of the capital cost, but produce four times the uh, expected computing power. Um, had they been able to follow all our recommendations, they would have saved about 95% of the electricity and half the capital by not putting in the chillers they won't need and still get four times the expected computing power. Our latest mine design runs on gravity. It doesn't use fossil fuel or electricity. Uh, and uh, of course, we couldn't do these things if uh, the stuff had been designed right in the first place. And uh, <clears throat> therefore, we're hatching a plot called 10XE, Factor 10 Engineering, uh, a plot for the nonviolent overthrow of bad engineering. Go to 10XE.org <laughs> to find out more. Uh, <clears throat> the supply side revolution in electricity is very straightforward. Um, Cogeneration in buildings and industry, and distributed renewables, all the renewables except big hydro, now make a sixth of the world's electricity, uh, more than nuclear, and they're adding 30 or 40 times more capacity every year uh, than nuclear. Actually, last year for the first time, uh, renewable power got more investment than fossil fuel power. And the US, led by Texas, in 2007 put in more wind power than the world put in nuclear power or more than the US put in coal power in the past five years combined. So the revolution's already happened, sorry if you missed it. And uh, this uh, huge switch in the market where the majority of the new electrical services are now coming from uh, efficiency and micropower is very good for climate and security uh, because if you buy efficiency in micropower instead of nuclear, you get about two to 20 times more climate protection per dollar, and you get it about 20 to 40 times faster. You free up a lot of money for other development needs. You help smoke out the folks who are spreading nuclear weapons by removing the ambiguity about why they want nuclear facilities, if you just take economics seriously. And the way to do this is, I think, just a conservative energy policy. Let's try letting always 
to save or produce energy, compete fairly at honest prices, regardless of their uh, type, technology, uh, location, size, or ownership. And let's see who's not in favor of that. This is perhaps politically difficult, but I think it's the key to a richer, fairer, cooler, and safer world. And if anything I've told you here seems too good to be true, just remember that little remark by Marshall McLuhan that only puny secrets need protection. Big discoveries like passive solar bananas are protected by public incredulity. Thank you very much.